Thank you, Jordan, and thank you to Sophia Jacob for having me, and of course to the library itself. This is a beautiful space. Both the Poe Room is absolutely beautiful and reminds me of Royal, Royal Tannenbaums, um, and also just the museum, uh, uh, library itself is almost like a museum in some way. It, it's more beautiful than I remember. Um, so I just want to jump right into, that's the way I've organized this, to um, jump right into some of the ideas behind my work. Um, some of you probably don't know anything about me, so maybe I should give you a little bit of a tidbit. Um, I started um, focusing on photography. That was my undergraduate degree, and I went to Atlanta College of Art um, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I actually am from the area, though. Um, grew up in Annapolis, and then um, after undergrad, I lived here in Baltimore for six years and did run a little gallery out of my space in Cebu called Space 126 for, I think, three of those years. Um, and one time we got Critics' Choice in the city paper, so that was nice. It was exciting. And then um, this is all pre-internet, so it was a different process of vetting people. They would just mail you things, and you'd have to mail them back. It's interesting. Um, and then I went to graduate school for sculpture and then returned to the area, um, not directly after, but I spent like four or five years in New York afterwards and then came back here. So primarily my work is sculpture, but there's also a lot of photography. And I noticed um, that a lot of the, the sculpture is influenced by photography in general as well. Okay, so going into some of the ideas. So modern man, we live in apartments, condos, and housing developments. When we're cold, instead of um, lighting a fire, we turn, turn up the thermostat. Our food is produced in factories. We earn money for um, it to use in exchange for this food in offices and other kinds of businesses. And then we purchase the food um, often at uh, self-checkout lines, which of course lacks intimacy. And I was just wondering, in general, like with my work, like do we ever look back? Do we ever look back to a time when like things were different, where um, you could directly source source your food, hunting and gathering, and things like that, and have a more intimate relationship with the land, essentially? Um, so I first became interested in artificial nature. Um, in 2000, around 2005. Previous to this, I was exploring a whole different issue. Um, and it began at first with my, me being curious about really, really artificial forms of artificial nature, like plastic deer, extremely plastic plants that you'd see at Michael's, things like that. And I was always wondering, like, is this just a copy of nature with no um, reference to the original? Or could this be um, in some ways, like an authentic uh, um, evidence of an authentic desire for connection to nature, some sort of like almost like a trinket that you'd have um, of a loved one while you're in like a distant land, like trying to um, remember like your forefathers or like your previous connection to the natural world. This is Disneyland. So here um, I've got a Baudrillard quote. It is no longer a question of imitation nor duplication nor even parody. It is a question of substituting the signs of the real for the real. That is to say of an operation of deterring every real process via its operational double, a programmatic, metastable, perfectly descriptive machine that offers all the signs of the real and short circuits all its vicissitudes. So with that, um, let me just get, where is, I'm not, I'm not great at public speaking, so hold on, <laughs> okay. Um, in other words, through design and advertising, we're affix, we've affixed uh, immutable icons to a system of biological and geological forms that are ever-changing. So almost snapshots of, of, um, of nature itself. So my first works in this area were, um, I did a series of waterfalls. This is waterfall number two. And this began my obsession with um, potted plants. Um, I think that they're really interesting because in some ways they show how we're, loving, we're lovingly caring for this plant life form, but at the same time it segregates us from this form, keeps it neat and clean. 
I was also interested um, in the beginning um, with advertisements for national parks and just other um, icons of nature. So. In um, 1872, Yellowstone was designated as the first national park. Eventually, nature tourism began um, to be in fashion, spurred on by railroad brochures, national park posters, and landscape photography. Which I was reading a book recently that was saying it's like um, nature pornography, like landscape pro um, photography, all editing out all of like the gruesome aspects of nature and just showing you this idealized and sanitized form. So I was really interested in this more campy um, idea of artificial nature at this time. And this piece, this is my thesis piece for graduate school, Still Life with Mountain Goat. Um, it's 10 feet tall up into the top of the chandelier. So hyper artificial, and hopefully, um, hopefully iconic. Okay, so long ago, man took shelter from nature in his own man-made world. Now he takes shelter from the man-made world in nature, or at least a simulacrum of nature, a new age health spa that we have created in the opposite image of the high pressured corporate world. So obviously nature can be dangerous, like look at like what just happened with Hurricane Sandy and there's Hurricane Katrina and everything else. Um, and then of course, um, there's dangerous things, d dangerous beasts like within the, you know, within nature and within the forest, wolves and, and things like that. Um, but then we've translated that um, and really kind of cut off again like the, the real truth of nature and, and instead um, create like a glossy version of it that can be um, a respite from the, the uh, man-made world. Okay, this is a Timberland logo. Um, so then I was thinking about how brands capitalize on this, um, this symbolic relationship to, to nature and oftentimes brands actually have absolutely nothing to do with with nature, selling this idea um, of a connection. So then I was starting to work on things that were almost related to product design. I did this with a, um, another student in graduate school, um, John Poninen, uh, and this is called OxySack. I don't have the original advertisement for this, but we actually created a little label for it that, with a little faux brand and everything. I think it was called Urban Hiker. And then also being interested in um, works that could, you know, be interactive. So here you can commune with, this is called um, Bear, Hug, Bear Hug Sleeping Unit. It's from 2007. And in this way you can commune and cuddle with like a grizzly bear, which would otherwise be impossible. There's, um, inside of it is speakers where there's bear breathing and heartbeat sounds. You can kind of cuddle with it. So then I was thinking about creating the idea of my own um, design brand, a kind of a fi fictional design brand, and I created this logo with my friend, um, designer Kelly Miller for Roar Design. Eventually I dropped this because I found it too limiting to continually create fictional um, uh, you know, product designs. But so the first, one of the first um, pieces that I did in that series is Black Bear Sconce, and this is basically supposed to be a replacement for the fear of the bestial, or the fear of basically attack by other beings, that you could have that in your home. And it's an actual sconce like, with lighting, or it can be hard hardwired. And then this is um, just Rock Chair from 2008. So part of also what I was interested in is not just creating like replacements for nature, but creating kind of pathetic replacements for nature, surrogates for nature that could never possibly suffice. And also thinking about how, how can um, there be um, you know, manifestations of unconscious desire, so have products that are almost as if they just kind of grew out of nothing. Um, as a part of your unconscious desire to be, you know, more animal-like or more in tune with the animal world. So this is Deer Boot advertisement. Here's some Deer Boots. 
very hard to walk in. And then this is called Disconnected. It's from 2009. And here I'm con comparing and contrasting how primi primates might um, interact with one another versus how we communicate with one another through technology. And I shot the video in Central Park Zoo because there's a whole bunch of um, snow monkeys there. And they do nothing but, but preen each other or um, groom each other all day. Also thinking about um, hair, body hair and facial hair as a sign of rebellion against contemporary culture and standards of beauty within contemporary culture. As, almost like something, especially if you were to have a beard or hairy legs or something like that in like the corporate environment, have that just be this kind of like quiet rebellion that you have um, at the same time as carrying on with like your regular life. So here I got a bunch of guys off of Craigslist. Um, there happened to be a, a beard and mustache convention in Brooklyn and gathered a bunch of people through that. That's why some people's beards are, well not that many, but this, the guy with the chopped beard is, it's pretty long. He's like, they actually compete in these um, beard competitions. And then this one is just Untitled Ankle. And uh, this piece, this performance award is called, it's called Award Plaque for H. Waldenford. It's basically a nod to um, Thoreau's Walden and contrasting value systems, like the value of being a, the sales leader for the month of October in 2004 versus the value of um, maybe going in a different direction and um, hunting and fishing instead. <laughs> and then I think it's really interesting when you see, um, you know, things like this, I'd rather be fishing. Um, this one I had custom printed and consider it a sculpture. Um, but, you know, I'm actually looking at, with all my work, like um, here's like faux wood right here. Um, all these other signs like around us, even um, textiles that have, um, images of nature on it. All of those things to me, like I'm wondering about, you know, I'm curious about, like could that be referencing something that we can't live without or is it just a copy that has no connection to um, our actual needs? So this one's um, in uh, Art Space, Connecticut and it's called Under the Desk Escape Unit but it was also in Baltimore List. So this is the first installation. Um, and with this one, I'll show you the inside. So this cabinet, by the way, is um, handmade, not a found object. It's just MDF with laminate. OK. And then a reused cubicle was altered so that you can go under the desk. There's a George Costanza um, scene in uh, one of the Seinfelds where he creates a little area under there. I think that might have been inspiration as well. So you can go inside of this cave. And you can also see there's actually a door hole so you can see if your boss's feet are out there and uh, figure out whether it's time to like come out or stay in there a little bit longer. And here there's a video of a cave pool where you can, you can see um, the dripping and hear the dripping of the water going into that cave pool. There's also, um, in the distance, very, very slight and sometimes not at all um, sounds of uh, um, bats. That's just the desk. Oops. And this piece is called Second Skin. It's just sewn a leather shirt our new hide. Okay, and then with the window series, I have a series of windows and they're all thinking about um, pretty much the same type of idea, which is basically um, inside versus outside, um, indoors versus outdoors. And with the idea of the outdoors um, being a, a symbol of nature, like the great outdoors, for example, um, but then on the other hand, when you actually go out, outdoors, it's the built environment still. You see sidewalks, you see landscape architecture, and so on. So it becomes, in a way, a philosophical search for nature. What is nature? Like, where do you find that? Where is that dividing line between the built 
environment and the natural world, if any. Okay, so this one's basically a light piece. It's kind of hard to tell, but you can see a little bit more from the side. It's called Window A. It's faux wood grain. Then this is Window B, which is essentially a painting on canvas that's um, pulled out from the wall and has um, cast plaster rocks as an element. And this is meant to emulate um, mini blinds. This is called Window C, Basement Sunset. So it's supposed to be hung um, very high up on a wall and emulate basically like um, a basement worker's experience of the sunset from the interior. Window D, this one is a mirror. It's printed on mirror. It's kind of hard to tell in the images. So, and the other thing is um, that I think is relevant with the mirror is that the the inside becomes, uh, or the outside becomes a reflection of the inside. You know that there is, um, the outside becomes a reflection also of ourselves. So, of course, you can see yourself like in this mirror. You don't, um, you're not able to see outside. And then this piece was um, basically situated with it, and it's called Root Balls, part, uh, sorry, part furniture design, part um, sculpture. This is a laser cut work on paper, also related to mini blinds. And two men's shirts, also creating, um, in my mind, um, blinds or something related to blinds, like the mini blinds. Okay, then um, this one's called Natural Lighting Emulator. Basically, this one, um, I'm try with this one, I'm trying to create a modeled um, lighting situation similar to the um, uneven lighting that you would get if you were in the woods uh, on a sunny day. So I've actually shot images of um, a, a dense tree canopy and, and captured the light coming through the tree canopy and then transferred that by having that cut out. I cut it out um, with a CNC router um, into ceiling tiles. Ideally, this piece would be an entire room, not just a freestanding structure, um, but this was for the Emerge Art Fair, and um, you're not, you know, you wasn't, I wasn't allowed to uh, connect to the walls or ceiling. This was also just recently up at, um, at Open Space. And this is a 2D piece that goes along with it. It's basically just the plan. This is what the actual image looks like that's cut out. And then this is one of the panels, laser cut, another 2D piece. And then this is Natural Lighting Emulator 2. There's um, an actual, a third one that's completely different that's in progress right now that I think is going to be really fun, um, called Portable Natural Lighting Emulator. Um, but this one here um, was at Flashpoint in DC, but also um, at the Sondheim. So with, with this, I'm cutting out vertical blinds, and the scale is pretty large. It's um, 84 by 74, oops, 84 by 74 um, by 6 with a steel frame that's very difficult to move. And then this is called Working in the Cloud. With this one, I'm thinking about um, cubicles and office furniture, but also the term working in the cloud. I'm really curious any time that we use words like um, cloud computing or the web or even mouse or anything like this, like why, are, why did we choose that out of like all of the things that we could have chosen to use? Why, why do we um, feel the need to pick things that are related to nature? And those are case fans with LED lights embedded in the piece. This one's called Equivalent Formation. Um, I, again, I'm really interested in planters and how planters become part of um, you know, interior architecture, especially in malls and offices, and also become a status symbol um, in office lobbies. 
And then this last piece, this is called um, In the Red after Magritte. Magritte has a similar painting. Um, but with this, it's I'm thinking about um, the, the security of our modes of survival, our current modes of, of survival during um, uh, economic downturns. And then that's it. Yeah, I mean, the, the room in, um, in the Contemporary Museum for Baltimore List was absolutely perfect for it. I didn't choose all of those elements, like the carpet and the, um, you know, molding and things like that, but it couldn't have been any more perfect, and it definitely made me feel that, you know, in the future I'll, I'll have a lot more of those details, and I do have some um, installations in the future where I'm thinking about doing that, you know, um, more of a complete environment. Um, I don't r write grants. I should do that, but I'm usually too busy. My schedule is too busy to even begin thinking about that. Um, essentially, I just fund it all myself and often put it all on the credit card and then just kind of like tick, it, tick away at that like per month. Like, and I do always manage to get everything down and just um, scrape by. Um, generally, my, generally, my work doesn't sell. Occasionally it does, but generally not. As you can see, it's usually more like installation or, or larger. Um, so that doesn't contribute that much to, um, to the, the bottom line with the studio work, but um, I don't know. I just kind of keep amping it up, actually. Each, each year it gets a little bit more, more expensive and more extreme. But <laughs> I don't know if my, what my husband thinks about me spending all that money on that. But Plus, I always want to take the summers off so I can spend more time on my work and make less money, <laughs> but.